In this segment, we are going to trace the major events and the roles of key leaders in the Civil War. That is, the war between the states, 1861 to 1865. As we go through this presentation, keep several questions in mind. What were the major military and political events of the Civil War? Who were the key leaders of the Civil War? Why did those southern states secede? Did any state really have the right to leave the Union? And was Lincoln right to use military force to keep the Union intact? When it comes to the Civil War, it was the secession of southern states that triggered the long and costly war that concluded with a northern victory and restoration of the Union and the emancipation of the slaves. But the Civil War put the constitutional government to its most important test as the debate over the power of the federal government versus states' rights reached a climax. The survival of the United States as one nation was at risk. The nation's ability to bring reality of the ideals of liberty and equality and justice depended on the outcome of this war. Now to take a look at the major events of the Civil War. The election of Abraham Lincoln triggered the secession of South Carolina, which was followed by other southern states of the Deep South. Even though Lincoln promised to leave slavery alone where it existed, these states decided it was not worth the risk. They feared the abolition of slavery and therefore left the Union, declared their independence, and formed the Confederate States of America. All throughout the Confederacy, the different forts surrendered to the Confederacy and raised the Confederate flag. It only made sense. After all, a fort in Georgia is going to be manned by men from Georgia who support secession and therefore raise the flag. Time and time again, one fort after another simply switched sides, changed the flag, and raised it up. But that was different at a place called Fort Sumter. This was the opening confrontation of the Civil War. It occurred on April 12, 1861. The South had attempted to take the fort. Neither side wanted to be the first one to fire a shot, but Jefferson Davis could not allow a Union fort to exist in Confederate territory. He knew he had to attack. The battle sparked secession of the Upper South as Abraham Lincoln called troops together in case of an emergency. And the Upper South included Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas. Those would be the remaining four states to join the original seven to form the Confederate States of America. Now, there were many, many battles in the Civil War in, throughout the South, especially here in Virginia, but also throughout the West. We are only going to focus on the few battles that are deemed turning points of the Civil War. The first one that was a major turning point was Antietam. At Antietam, it was General McClellan, the leader of the Army of the Potomac, that is the key Union army, tracked down Robert E. Lee and attacked him in September of 1862. This was considered to be the bloodiest day of battle in American history. One day, thousands and thousands and thousands of Americans lay dead on the battlefield. Some people said that you could walk across the entire battle of battlefield without touching the ground, only walking on the corpses that lay there. It was brutal. Now, up until this time, the Union had been losing many, many battles. But this one was the Union victory that was necessary. Abraham Lincoln took this moment, took this battle, to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. I'll talk more about the Emancipation Proclamation in the next segment, but he did need a victory in order to, in many people's terms, free the slaves. The true turning point, militarily, happened at Gettysburg, 
This was a week-long battle that happened in July of 1863. Robert E. Lee was under pressure in Virginia, and he needed to relieve the Union forces who were outside pressing against the city of Richmond, which was now the Confederate capital. Robert E. Lee believed that if he attacked north, that would relieve pressure on the city of Richmond, as Union troops would have to leave Richmond to go defend in Pennsylvania. We're not really sure exactly what his ultimate target was. Perhaps it was Philadelphia. Uh, perhaps it was even further north. But Robert E. Lee, his goal was to relieve that pressure on the south and force the Union back north to play defense. It didn't work. Too many mistakes were made by Robert E. Lee and his, and, and his generals. Uh, time and time again, while it looked like they had the battle in hand, a mistake would be made, allowing the Union to regroup and counterattack. And eventually, Robert E. Lee needed to flee. This ended any hope of Southern advance. And that's why this is the turning point of the war. Robert E. Lee lost so many troops that he could never attack. All he could do was defend. And so Robert E. Lee fell back, dropped back, retreated back to defend Richmond and to defend uh, Petersburg, which was the center of, of the railroads in the South and all the transportation and communication that was going on. But eventually, time ran out for Robert E. Lee. Ultimately, he could not hold Richmond. He sent word to the, to the Capitol and to Jefferson Davis and the Confederate Congress that he could not hold Richmond any longer. Petersburg had fallen and he needed to retreat. Robert E. Lee fled westward to Appomattox Courthouse and the city of Richmond was essentially burned to the ground, not by the Union forces, but by the Confederates as they left. On April 9th, 1865, after Petersburg and Richmond had fallen, Robert E. Lee was willing to negotiate terms of surrender to Ulysses S. Grant. This was the site of Robert E. Lee's surrender at Appomattox Courthouse, April 9th, 1865. This is going to formally end the Civil War. Robert E. Lee was given various, very generous terms of surrender. He was not embarrassed. It was actually more of a casual meeting between the, these two men where Robert E. Lee did not know what to expect. Uh, General Grant had the, uh, had, was given the nickname Unconditional Surrender. So Robert E. Lee did not know what to expect. But generous terms were offered, as Abraham Lincoln would describe later, with malice toward none, meaning we're not going to hold a grudge. General Grant and Robert E. Lee had a long conversation, signed the terms of surrender, and the men went home. Not to prisons, but the men went home. And that effectively ended the Civil War. Some of the key leaders in their roles, guys that we need to be sure that we remember and talk about, obviously Abraham Lincoln, we know Old Honest Abe, he was the president of the Union during the entire Civil War. He insisted that the Union be held together by force, if necessary. He issues the Emancipation Proclamation, which is going to help lead the way towards the emancipation of all the slaves. And his idea that the United States was not a collection of states, but an indivisible nation rang true and was realized through the efforts of the Civil War. His Confederate counterpart was Jefferson Davis. Jefferson Davis had served as a U.S. Senator before the war, but once the session occurred, he was elected President of the Confederacy, and he operated in that post until after the war when he was arrested, imprisoned, and then released. 
On the Union side, we talk about Ulysses S. Grant as being the prominent general. Um, he was a Union commander. His early successes, though, came in battles in the West, where he won several key battles, including Vicksburg, which secured the Mississippi River in Union hands. And he found that he could be victorious after others had failed. Ulysses S. Grant was not the first commander, or even the second, or the third. He came after a series of other commanders failed, beginning with George McClellan. They failed. Finally, uh, Abraham Lincoln saw that Ulysses S. Grant was getting success in the West, called him up and said, hey, come over here and be my guy and be in charge of all these forces, which Grant agreed to do and was quite successful. After all, he did accept the, the surrender of, of Robert E. Lee. Speaking of Robert E. Lee, very important Virginian to know. He was the Confederate general of the Army of Northern Virginia. It was only later in the war that he was given command of all the Confederate troops. Uh, he began simply as the general of the Army of Northern Virginia. Robert E. Lee even opposed secession. Robert E. Lee did not think that Virginia was right to leave the Union. However, he knew that he could not raise his sword against what he called his country of Virginia. And so therefore, reported for duty and accepted being the general of the Army of Northern Virginia to protect Virginia from the Union forces. After Fort Sumter, he obviously became involved, and after the war, he urged rapid reunification. And we'll talk about this in one of our later modules, Robert E. Lee's efforts to bring the Union back together so that we could be one nation. Frederick Douglass played a very important and prominent role during the Civil War. He became an abolitionist, a, a staunch abolitionist, in the 1840s and 50s. And during the Civil War, he was already a very famous American. He used his prestige and his influence to not only encourage the abolitionist movement, but also to urge Abraham Lincoln to recruit and use former slaves and freed blacks in the North to fight in the Union Army. Frederick Douglass's efforts actually resulted in raising the very first African-American troops in the United States. The Civil War, that battle between the North and the South, was triggered by secession. And it was a long and costly war that concluded with a northern victory, restoration of the Union, and the emancipation of the slaves. It put that constitutional government to its ultimate test. And we do know that after this climax, the survival of the United States as one nation, indivisible, could not be shaken. And the ideals of liberty, equality, and justice were realized.